would like to start this press conference. I'm the moderator of the session. My name is Paul van Schill. I'm a thoracic surgeon in Antwerp, Belgium. We have five presentations this morning, so I propose that we keep a strict timing, that we have 12 minutes in total for the presentation and for the question and answers. Dr. Louis Passares, who is the first on the list, is unfortunately still at another session, so we move him backwards. And we start with Dr. Bill Evans, who is the president of the Uravinsky Cancer Center at Hamilton Health Sciences in Canada. And he will give a lecture on Canada's cancer risk management model is an important new health tool for policy makers. Great. Thanks very much. So this uh, um, talk is about a new health policy tool that we've developed in Canada, which we, help, we think will inform decision makers about how to make future decisions about where to put resources for uh, cancer. Uh, the first module we developed relates to lung cancer, but there are other modules for colorectal cancer, cervix, and we'll be doing breast and prostate. It's a collaboration between clinicians like myself, um, principally based at McMaster University, uh, the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer, which is a federally funded agency to improve cancer control in Canada, and health uh, analysis modelers at Statistics Canada, federal government department. It's a web-based uh, modeling platform, and it's web-based because we want to make it accessible to people in Canada. Indeed, it's accessible via the web to anyone through uh, the Cancer View Canada website. And it will project the future burden of cancer in Canada as well as the macroeconomic impacts of caring for cancer patients and will allow us to look at what the impact would be of future cancer control interventions. And as I say, it's meant to inform policymakers in government and cancer agencies about the future investments they're going to have to make in cancer control. And as we get into a more and more fis fiscally constrained environment in Canada and indeed the developed world, policymakers really have to decide where they're going to put their next investments. Is it screening or is it treatment advanced disease? Is it supportive care? And this model gives them an opportunity to do so. So as a conceptual model, you can see it breaks down rather simply. There are risk factors for cancer as it relates to lung cancer, obviously smoking, radon exposure. Uh, we've heard at this meeting about screening. We have not yet modeled screening, but that's our next initiative. Uh, we've modeled current treatments into the uh, model, and included in that is uh, cost and survival and health utility. And you can see on the right-hand side of the screen the various outputs that the model can produce, including uh, incidents into the future, um, the cancer deaths that will occur, the resources that will be needed to treat people, to screen people, the cost per life year of various interventions, and other e economic impacts, including revenues to the government. So to develop a model of this complexity requires a lot of data sources, and this is sort of a summary list of all of those and not meant to uh, be taken uh, by you in detail, but obviously there are sources of incidence and uh, death and uh, screen, uh, uh, staging for uh, cancer in our cancer registry nationally. You get smoking rates and other risk factors from survey information. Uh, we have files on the earnings of Canadians, uh, transfers like pensions and taxation, and so on. And all of this is integrated into the model. This looks more like an electronic diagram than a care path, but in fact this is a model of the care paths for lung cancer and what's built into the model. And we vetted this with Canadian oncologists across our country, and they believe it's a fair representation of how lung cancer is managed in our country. And when you uh, link that up with cost and with uh, survival information, then you can run the model to address various policy questions. And I think most of us who are engaged and have been engaged in treating lung cancer over the years feel that probably the best strategy is to prevent the disease in the first instance. So here we've modeled as an example what would happen if we were able to reduce smoking rates in Canada, currently at about 22%. And if you brought that down by half to 11% and did it over different time frames, three years, five years, 10 years, you can see how it projects out in terms of the number of lung cancer cases. And furthermore, you can see the life years gained, that if you look at a 50% reduction over five years, the life year gained over almost 600,000 life years. And you would have direct health care savings of over uh, $650 million. 
uh, but you would also, from a government point of view, lose tax revenues of about $80 billion. And so you can see the tension that would exist, particularly in a financially constrained environment. And on the opening uh, plenary session with Richard Pato, he indicated that the, probably the, one of the better strategies is to increase cigarette taxes so the government gets more revenue and it will drive down the number of smokers so you could get a win-win uh, out of it. So just in, in summary, what it would do in terms of lung cancer specifically is a slightly at variance what you have in the abstract. It's a decrease of about 40,000 uh, um, lung cancer cases over 20 years. Uh, the prevalence of lung cancer would go down by over 70,000 and the reduction in deaths would be in the order of 25,000. So very significant impacts by an intervention related to um, smoking cessation. Here I'm showing um, some data from Ontario, which shows the rate of uptake of adjuvant chemotherapy. And I would say this has probably uh, been the second most powerful uh, thing we could do to reduce deaths from lung cancer, because from a Canadian trial, it was a 15% uh, absolute decrease or increase in survival at five years for patient, patients receiving adjuvant chemotherapy. But when you look at those blue bars, the range is from about 17% uptake in some regions of our province to 70%. So huge differences. And when you model at a Canadian level an, an uptake rate of 20%, around the lowest level, you see what the direct health care cost of that would be, but the life year gains are quite substantial. If you push that up to 70%, which seems to be what is achievable and certainly desirable, the health care costs only go up very modestly. In fact, only about $130,000 increase nationally, and yet life year gains goes up quite substantially. Well, how can that be? And you can see a little bit of an explanation at the bottom there where you, you don't have to expend money on second-line chemotherapy for palliative care, supportive care, and because of those savings, and this ends up to being a, a very, very cost-effective intervention at about $100 per life year gain. You don't see that very often. Screening, I said we will model. We haven't yet, but here we can show how the model will tell us how many patients would fall into the categories that would be candidates for screening if we use the NLST uh, eligibility criteria, 55 to 74. It's a little over 2 million uh, individuals who are 30-pack year smokers in our country. If you maybe changed it a little bit, you can get a different number, and we could break this down by individual province. The provinces could then extrapolate that into the CT scan uh, resource requirements and the costs. And finally, I'll just show you one other model to, to, to illustrate the potential of, of what we've done. And this is the impact of introducing a new but expensive uh, chemotherapy drug. So predominantly in our country, patients are treated with gemcitabine cisplatinum. And you see what the cost of that is over years with projections out as the numbers of cancer patients increase who have either stage 4 disease of presentation or acquire stage 4 or metastatic disease over the course of their illness. And as the numbers of patients increase, obviously the costs increase. If you introduced bevacizumab in com combination with taxol carboplatinum to those patients who would be potential candidates, roughly 40% of the total number, you see that there's an incremental cost that's quite substantial and in, would over the a five year cumulative budgetary impact of 185 million. Well, this is just information that can be used by policymakers as they contemplate where are you going to invest your next dollars in a fiscally constrained environment? So these are some of the policy questions that the cancer risk management model can address. How changes in smoking rates by province and, um, would, be, uh, would impact a uh, number of lung cancer cases down to age, gender, cell type and stage. Uh, the health impacts and outcomes of the introduction of a population-based screening program, the provincial or national level and the likely effect of new interventions on disease progression, life expectancy, years lived in health, budget impact and cost effectiveness for things like adjuvant chemotherapy and new systemic therapy for advanced disease. So I hope you found that interesting. It's a brief overview of what is a very complex model, but we think a useful policy uh, tool for our country. And as it's web-based, it can be modified in other jurisdictions as well. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Evans. In fact, there are many conflicting interests, and thank you for this important contribution. Are there any questions for Dr. Evans? Yes, please. Um, Susan Mayer from the British Medical Journal. Um, the, the model has obviously been developed for 
Canada based on your uh, costs and outcomes in Canada, is that right? But could other countries, and you've said it's available on the web, can other countries use some of the modelling process adapted with their own data? Does it have any transferability? Well, we've developed the model in a very transparent way, um, and we've done it uh, so that others can use the model in their own jurisdictions, because even in Canada, some of the costs vary, so that an individual in British Columbia might have some different cost information than in, on Ontario. So you can go in with some training to uh, tweak the model to your own jurisdiction. It's possible with training, in fact, if you're really expert in modeling, with, with permissions to go in and do this from any jurisdiction. It is a web-based program and it is meant to be useful across jurisdictions. It's not meant to be exclusively Canadian oriented, but it would have to be with uh, training and with permissions through the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer. Any more questions? Or? Then we